Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to this Teacher Academy webinar organized by School Education Gateway. My name is Marta, and I will be your host for today. But before we start, just a practical information for the audience. The webinar is recorded, and the recording might be used for dissemination purposes. And please, if you have any questions or comments, thoughts, feel free to post it in the chat, and we will have also a Q&A session towards the end to address your your questions. OK, let's move on now. The focus for today is learning and care for the youngest refugees, a critical priority across Europe. This webinar addresses and discusses the priority to responsibly sustain the learning and healthy development of young refugee children who flee Ukraine by providing them with quality support through ECAG services and by supporting the key adults in their life, their parents and the early child, childhood education and care professionals. A closer look at needs, programs, priorities, barriers and possible solutions is shared based on the information collected from the countries where the International Step-by-Step -Step Association member organizations are actively involved in the response addressing early childhood. And without further ado, for me, it's a great pleasure to introduce you our guest speaker for today, Mihaela Ionescu, Program Director at the International Step-by-Step -Step Association. So thank you very much, Mihaela, to be with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Marla, Marta, and uh, a warm welcome from my end too, and I hope that the hour that we will spend together will be inspirational for all participants and hope that we will be able to answer at least some of the concerns that we are having in this very challenging period when we need to deliver for the youngest ones that have fled Ukraine, but also those that are in Ukraine. Um, I'm going to talk from the experience of uh, that we have had in the past four months. Uh, since February um, within the organization when I'm the program director, International Step-by-Step -Step Association. Just briefly for those of you who do not know our organization, we are a professional association and we have 95 member organizations that are working in the field of early childhood and we stretch from Europe to Central Asia, more than 40 countries and we have uh, 20 years of experience in the field at least. Um, as an organization, we promote early childhood competence systems, and uh, we also focus very much on how we can support uh, the early childhood development, considering it the most important period in an individual's life, and of qualified and competent workforce. And we strive to achieve as across all the countries where we are working, quality, equitable, and integrated services for all children and families. This is what we are doing through all our programs. Um, but I think that we are in a privileged situation also as a network. There has been a report that has been um, committed, commissioned in 2020 when the pandemic started. And uh, there, was a lot, there were a lot of lessons learned from the work that the networks are doing. And it was not just the network that I'm representing. There are other networks that focus on early childhood across the globe. Uh, there was one thing that struck me in the report that was developed by Network Impact. Uh, there are professionals working in this field of networking. And they said that the networks are well placed to address complicated problems in the following cases. If the problem that you're trying to address has no clear recipe or formula for success, or cuts across sectors or fields of practice, or is evolving and requires solutions that evolve with it, or cannot be addressed effectively by single individual organizations. That's where the networks are working. And I think uh, not just networks like my, uh, the, the one that I'm representing, but in general, networks of organizations are much more well equipped to address such complex problems as the one that we are facing. We have faced during the pandemic, but we are facing also today in trying to provide uh, a suitable response for um, the young refugee children that have fled Ukraine. As an organization, um, since the first day of the war in Ukraine, as we have members in Ukraine and also in the neighboring countries, uh, we have closely supported them in, in finding solutions and trying to understand, learning about the needs 
as well as how how to provide those kind of uh, support, that kind of support that is most meaningful. And we work primarily and we continue to work uh, in Ukraine, in Moldova, Romania, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and we are expanding it to other countries because we are quite aware that a lot of work will be needed, not only in these countries that have been strongly affected uh, since the day, first day of the war, but also that there will be a spillover effect in the countries where refugees will uh, arrive. And networks are well equipped to have their uh, mechanisms for uh, peer learning and for support uh, across its members. Well, since the first day of the war, we said that we have been uh, in contact with the member organizations in the countries. And I know that many of the countries where we are working are also represented today uh, by our participants. And I think that uh, I saw that there are also participants from Greece. They also know how it has been and how it still is to welcome refugee children in, in the country. But by quickly, quickly scanning the context that we are witnessing today, there are a few reflections that we have had and informed a lot the work that we are doing. And I, I, I just want to share them with you because there might be things, insights, let's say, that are useful uh, for reflecting further what can we do best uh, to meet the needs of, of the youngest children and their families. And I will start by saying that each child and family uh, might be in a different situation when they arrive um, in, at the border. Some of them I want to stay, some of them are just transitioning, or some of them I, I just don't know what to do, are still in a standby. And that influences a lot the way that they are responding to any kind of support that is provided. Also that the young children are accompanied by mothers primarily, and or, or by a, another female adult, can be grandmothers or aunts, or um, and their siblings. And sometimes there are families with two or three children of different ages. Um, and most importantly, they have been separated from their fathers. And that impacts a lot, uh, the child's life and the family dynamics in general, and follows them wherever they are. Um, another um, observation uh, that we ha have had uh, by just uh, scanning the, the context across countries is that there is a tendency to put all refugees in the same basket, in the same box, while actually there are different needs that they have. Um, the only thing that connects them is that they have been through traumatic experiences and they're still going through that, many of them reacting differently. But they, they have something in common, but that doesn't mean that all of them are alike. Children are different. We are unique in general, but this, uh, the fact that they are refugees does not reduce them to the status of being a refugee. Another thing that we noticed is that there is a lot of emphasis put into providing emergency support. And we certainly agree that uh, safety, protection, food and good health are of immediate importance uh, to safeguard the lives and to provide whatever is needed at the very, very, very beginning when they have uh, transited the border. But we just learned so much in, in, in the months that followed that it's equally important to support the mental health and recovering their routines, their sense of stability and emotional security, as well as transitioning to a different life and to a different environment. And that's not an easy thing to do for anybody, but especially if you have fled because of the war. Also, we have learned and that uh, it has been uh, very encouraging to see that a lot of policy measures to provide free access to services uh, are, are, have been and are being issued in many of the European countries. And the European Commission has supported a lot of these uh, measures. But there is still uh, what we have noticed, insufficient readiness at the national and also at the local level to provide responsive solutions and flexible solutions meeting the needs of, of the children and of their families. Even if we build the early childhood education and care system readiness, we also need to look how ready are the children and the families to access those services. So these readinesses need to meet. There needs to be there needs to be a, um, a quite aligned, let's say, approach from uh, the system perspective towards the families and children's perspective, and that requires a more comprehensive understanding of where the early childhood education and care system sits. 
I'm, I think that many of you are familiar with the um, uh, Brockman Brenner's uh, theory of ecological system, uh, 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 ecological system, and I think for an individual uh, personal development, it is crucially important to understand, especially in times of crisis, that there are so many factors that are interplaying in trying to find uh, that that context that is sufficient, nurturing, uh, and welcoming for uh, the refugees. And across all these systems, uh, there are many factors inside the microsystem, the mesosystem, the uh, macrosystem, exosystem, all those factors interact between themselves and all of them interact with the individual, be that a child or be that um, an adult. And all are evolving across time and have their own, let's say, footprint and into the individual's development. It's important to notice that the early childhood education and care system and all the services that are provided for, for the child are actually in the microsystem. And they, they, they therefore play a very important role that are surrounding the child and the family alongside all other uh, services or other friends, or um, uh, the, the health system, the social services, all along uh, they're having their own input and impact. But in, in all this constellation of services and of factors, some of them easy to be controlled. I think just by going back to the to the Brofenbrenner um, theory, it's important also from the perspective from which we look at this uh, um, visual. If you're a practitioner, if you're a parent, if you're a policymaker, where do you, are you situated, let's say, in, in the system and where you can exert an influence? which of the things are in the proximal, let's say, area of your influ direct influence, how much you can contribute to creating an ecosystem, in this case, for refugee children and their families, so that they, the traumatic events are not impacting dramatically their life. And th th these are a, a, a few key points, actually, that uh, have, have driven also all our efforts from the beginning of the war. Uh, of the war. We're, we do know that the early years are so important for, for the individual's life. I mean, they impact, they have long-term impact on health, on, on realization, on their success, personal and professional. Therefore, we can't neglect this period of time and we can't neglect everything that should be provided for children at this age. Child development, on the other hand, is, is a very co complex thing. It, it, it encompasses different types of development areas that are all interacting. We talk about emotional, physical, uh, social, emotional, um, uh, in cognitive. The, all of them are equally important and they interact with each other. That means that the interventions that we are, the support that we are providing cannot focus only on one of them. They need to be uh, addressed in a, in a very holistic way. And that's what the early childhood education and care services are doing through daycares, nurseries, creches, and, and kindergartens, preschools, however they are named or called in different countries. On the other hand, the child, child development and it's, uh, the child well-being depends on the family well-being, meaning that we can't just address the child needs, we need to address the family's needs. And in the case of families that have fled, I'm saying again, mostly mothers or female adults that are with children, it's very important to consider from their perspective what are their needs and how they should be catered. Another important aspect that we uh, are, has mobilized, let's say, a lot of our efforts is the fact that the traumatic events can strongly affect the child development. And when we say traumatic events, war is, let's say, one of the extreme events that can impact their life. But there are many other traumatic events in child's life that can be a separation of, of parents or um, natural disasters. There are many other uh, contexts that can be harmful or violence. And you might also be familiar with this uh, visual uh, from colleagues from Harvard Center on developing child that are talking about different levels of stress in, in, in the child's life and in, in the individual life, not only children. And there is a, a positive stress and a tolerable one, but the toxic one is the one that is most damaging especially in the early years of an individual. And if stress is repeatedly uh, continuing uh, impacting uh, the child's development and there are no supportive relationships around, protective and supportive relationships, 
then it affects the child development and hand can have impact towards long-term diseases when in their adult life. And that's something that we can prevent. And that's actually the, the, the engine that mobilized all efforts as early childhood professionals. We said that the child well-being depends on families' well-being, but the family's well-being depends also on the communities where they settle in and also on the services that they can benefit from. And now in this visual, you can see a more kind of zoomed in and to those circles around the child and the family that, and the community that actually have a long uh, term impact on their lives. And we talk now about refugees, but this is very valid for all children and families that are living in young children that are living in communities. And the child development is not always seen as a priority at the level of a community or a municipality. But actually everything that happens around the child in the neighborhood and in the community and the services that are provided, what kind of services, how well they meet the needs of the families matters a lot in the way that the child's development is supported. Well, we have asked ourselves, and that's something that actually we would like to also discuss a little bit with you as you're coming from different countries. How ready are the early childhood education and care systems to welcome and meet the needs of the needs of refugee children and of their families? And also how ready are the young refugee children and their families to attend the early childhood services? These are two questions that we think are so important in trying to provide uh, sustainable solutions, but also effective solutions. And for this reason, I will share later on what is our perception and uh, from what we have learned, our assessment, not only perception, by working with uh, different organizations in countries and by knowing a lot of what's happening in the early childhood systems in general. Um, we want to ask now you to see from your perspective, you might work, uh, I, I don't know exactly where do you work and what is your position, uh, professional uh, um, position, but I do hope that there are many of you that have knowledge about the early childhood education and care services in your country and how the system is functioning. I was wondering if you were to look at the six factors that I've um, identified, which one you would think has, uh, is the, it's, or they say, of the highest priority to be addressed in order to build the system readiness to welcome the refugee. Is it about policies? Do we need enabling policies? for supporting uh, refugee families? Is it about the availability of uh, early childhood education and care services? Um, to include about the availability of places in the services? Is it about how prepared is the staff in the services to work with refugee children and their families? Is the language barrier the highest priority to be addressed? Or is the availability of different types of services, not only the um, kindergartens or the creches, maybe other types of services would be needed, playgroups or family hubs, so that they ensure a smooth transition into the more formal. Or is it about uh, uh, the urgency to address the coordination between different types of services, like early childhood education and care, health services, social assistance. They are different, as I said, in, in the constellation of services in the community that are different ones. And families, mothers, I would say, might encounter different challenges. So if you were to name the highest priority, which one you would, um, you would uh, mention? You can put the number. Number six, I see Ketavan. I see Kensia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Kensia, perhaps, preparation of staff. And the number six, coordination of services. So which one do you consider to be of the highest priority to be addressed in order to meet in the best way the needs of young uh, refugee children? So we have coordination having more numbers there, four and five, four, two, six, 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 six and five. Okay, six, many are for the coordination. Number two, availability of places. Julian, yes, serving number six. Two and five, Jennifer, the availability of places and availability of other types of services, not just 
Yes, it very much depends on the country. And I, I actually ask you for your country, not for all the countries. <laughs> yeah, just by looking at, at your situation. And it might be that uh, you do not necessarily have received a lot of refugee uh, children and, and families from Ukraine, but it could be that you might have had other types of refugee. Or if you think in general of your country, if refugees are coming, which ones do you think should be addressed? Yeah, like high priority. Anastasia, all, I agree with you. <laughs> but, um, okay. Let's hear if, if there are more colleagues that want to share their view. I see that, I would say that the one that the, got the highest vote is number six. And then I think it was nine, number five. And um, well, somewhere four and then two perhaps. Well, if you say all of them, that means that the, the systems are not ready, I would say, if, if all of them are equally important to be addressed. Well, which in, to a great extent, I have to say that perhaps at different degrees, but the urgency is um, on different aspects of the system. Um, I would say that sometimes it might be that the policies have been more enabling, but the system didn't manage to get to the policy implementation that quickly. Let's move to the next question and see what do you think um, that, how ready do you think that the young refugee children and their families are to access uh, and participate in the services in the early childhood education and care? So we talk about creches and kindergartens, preschools. Which of the situations below, so these this seven ones, you recognize as they have the highest impact in how ready they are? So how much they influence the children's choice to attend and the family's choice to attend the services? Language is a major barrier. So this could be a reason for which they would not attend. Um, overall insecurity in preventing, uh, is preventing families to access. Uh, the services. So they are not sure of anything in their lives. Uh, or children do not feel comfortable to get separated from, for, from their family for too much time. Or mothers cope with too many challenges that they, they can't even think of, of uh, letting children, um, they, they, they can't manage that also. Or mothers, mothers fear that children will not feel welcome and comfortable in the services. Another reason could be uh, that they come or they don't come, provision of transitioning and support activities in services. This might be something that could encourage. Uh, or seven, mothers are in great need actually of services. Which one do you think that uh, is the one that uh, influences the most uh, their readiness to access the services? Let's see one in six, language is a major barrier and mothers are in great need. These are kind of contradicting. They want to, but the language is a barrier. One in six, I see a lot. Thank you, Anastasia, Renata, Katarina, Mihai, Ain, Parante, four, Ketavan. Um, mothers cope with too many challenges, yes. Okay, very true, Kemal, in, in Turkey, yes. Two, three, five, six, so insecurity, children don't feel comfortable, Mothers fear that their children and provision of transitioning could help. Yes. Gal, I see five. Mothers fear that children will not feel welcome. Yes. One in four. I see a mixture of everything. And I have to say that I think that uh, uh, in many countries, there is uh, many of these factors are interplaying. So it's a configuration of factors that can prevent them. But overall, we can say they might not be ready, even if the services are there. And we have to find solutions on how we meet their needs. Yeah, I see a lot of ones also, the language barrier, very true. And as you could see in all, all these situations, it could be that they want to, but it's not that easy, uh, or they have a lot of fears that can prevent them. So how we can address those fears so that they, we kind of increase their readiness to participate. Having services ready might not necessarily be enough. We need to see how we can meet those specific needs. Thank you, Magdalena, one and three, language and children do not feel comfortable. Well, this says that we are not ready in terms of services. If we don't know how to address the language barrier, and also if we don't know how to make them feel comfortable um, so that they feel safe uh, 
even if they are separated? Or what kind of services we should provide so that they don't feel the separation as so painful or they have the feeling of safety, emotional safety? Thank you so much. This has been very useful in, in getting an understanding how you perceive actually, I, I just put into balance the readiness of systems and readiness of those that would attend the services. And you can see that there are a different, uh, a different levels, let's say. We can see on, on, a, on a scale that it could vary a lot from one country to another. There might be countries that are better prepared, but still we need to be very careful how ready are the ones that have fled to attend. Well, what has been our analysis and what we could just draw as conclusion, I would say, from what has happened in the past month. And I, I don't know if this is useful or not. I'm just going to share our experience. And maybe this could be, as I said, inspirational for reflection or even thinking more strategically, what would be the next steps to address and what stays in our remit of influence to do. As an us as a professional association, having organizations working in countries, we have, let's say, aligned our thinking around what are the priorities, knowing what happens in the, in, in the countries where we, we work. An important principle everybody might share, do no harm. We, everybody's well-intentioned and everybody wants to support everybody. I mean, most of the people uh, are quite genuinely interested to support. But in the early childhood education and care services, I would say that many of the people are really committed to do that. It's only that there is a lack of knowledge and, and the skills on how to provide that kind of support that those uh, children need. And for this reason, uh, professionals might feel inhibited or might not know exactly, or they are not ha so confident that they are doing the right thing, which is they, how to say, it's a danger, right? Um, so this is so, we, we just noticed there's no preparation for this uh, across countries. This has not been part of any professional development training uh, even though children are exposed to traumatic events, not only because of the war, as I said, of different 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 types of reasons. The second type, I think, thing that we we draw as a conclusion is that ensuring services that are tailored to the needs is one a priority that is so important. That means it might be that one service, you know, one size fits all, does not work for 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 those children. We said they are different. They might come with different. Um, they they. They bring their identities, but also their histories. And it might be that adjusting the service to, to the needs, it might be too difficult. So we need to find flexible uh, programs, flexible solutions. And th those need to be locally driven, not necessarily. We can have a framework at the national level, but at the local level, it's where people are arriving in specific cities, municipalities. So we need to find those solutions at the local level with the capacity and the people that are there. Also, we just noticed that sometimes faster is not necessarily better. So rushing into wanting to bring them in the services might not necessarily be the solution, might be very difficult for professionals and also for, for children and for families. And that means that you need to have a more of a strategic plan. What's the immediate response? What's the short time? What's on the medium uh, term? So that you, you create that readiness for both the service and the um, um the services and the families to and children to attend the services. Avoiding segregation is so important um, because there is a tendency, especially because of the language, that the children are put together and they are separated from the, let's say, majority uh, of, of population where the, uh, in the host country, and that can be very dangerous. So avoiding segregation is so, so important. That's why locally driven solutions are so important because it would be best if children are absorbed in larger communities of children and there is an intercultural dialogue, dialogue there. There's a lot of learning and these need time. And that's why faster is not always better because everything needs time. Providing support to prevent, um, uh, providing support to prevent uh, overstress and burnout in the professionals. I think this is something that we've noted not only in the in Ukraine, I have to say, but also in the countries that have worked in in the neighboring countries where the influx of refugees has been very high. A lot of a lot of people wanted to help, and a lot of professionals in the in the services uh, have engaged themselves in in uh, providing a, a, pro a prompt response. But this can become very uh, overwhelming at certain point because there are all kinds of stories and, and you can see a lot of things you recognize or, or that people have been through very harmful situations and uh, very hard. 
and that beca- that kind of work uh, becomes sometimes uh, um, overly stressful for the professionals trying to help as much as they can. So that's an important part in also in these kind of situations, how to to um, help professionals to protect themselves while providing the support that is needed. And the other observation that we have had is that, especially if we talk about the early childhood education and care services, as I said, creches, kindergartens or um, or preschools, is that one service will not solve the problem. These are complex problems that the families and children are are, um, facing. So there needs to be a, a network of services. And these are the things that we said, these are so, so important to be addressed. Well, what means... If we translate them, what this means in do no harm principles, there is a huge demand for building the capacity in the systems um, um, or, or other stuff that are working, stuff that, are, that is working in other services too. How to work with children and families who have been through traumatic experiences. And that's something that needs to be put in place, you know, kind of immediately. Uh, and there's a lot of expertise in so many organizations. It just needs to be consolidated, hard to say, it needs to be catalyzed. Um, ensuring that services are are tailored to the needs. That means that faster is not necessarily better. We need to have a needs analysis. We can't have uh, solutions that are responsive if we don't know about, if we don't learn about their needs and then see how those can be uh, addressed. And this is very difficult to do at the national level. You might learn something, but at the local level, they can be done. And that's the part perhaps of the system that can activate a lot of good uh, measures. So how can we do place-based, responsive, and also transitioning services? Because it might be that a service does not fit the the needs. Faster is not necessarily better. As I was saying, there has to be a strategic thinking and and, an approach. And that's perhaps something that is not always embraced, uh, especially at the local level, to, to really make a plan on how to address the needs of the refugee children, but in general of the vulnerable uh, population. There needs to be immediate, short, um, mid-term and long-term uh, solutions. For those that, for example, would like to, to settle in. Avoiding segregation. I think this is an, uh, a problem that uh, it's a recurrent problem, I would say, in, in certain countries. Um, and I think that there is already a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of policies that can be leveraged. I don't think that in terms of policies, countries are not doing well. I think that the practices are the ones that are, are still lagging behind. But I think that there have been a lot of capacity building on in this field also. So how we can leverage all that knowledge that has been uh, invested in systems for increasing this access and, and not only to for refugees, but for all vulnerable children. So that still remains as, as um, an issue to be tackled. It can be combined with the work that is done uh, uh, around uh, psychological first aid uh, together with addressing inclusion. And the other point that I was mentioning, one type of service will not solve the problem. The coordination of structures and mechanisms, this is a priority across all systems. I have to say some countries are making more progress because they have had issues, complex issues uh, like migration that had to be tackled, not refugees, migration, and a a lot of uh, population that we need uh, different types of support and that required networking. So there are some countries that have been already through this experience that have learned and built more mechanisms for cooperation, but that's some, still an issue that at the system level stays as being um, a, a problem still to be addressed. I will just share with you what how this all these thoughts kind of catalyzed in our thinking, and I will share then what we have started doing, and maybe this could be something that um, could be mobilized in more countries to happen because it's not just about my, the organization I'm representing or the organizations I'm representing as those that are working in countries. There are many organizations that can help. So how, how we can catalyze the expertise that exists in, in many organizations, how we can connect and consolidate uh, something that can create social impact in the context of each country by providing uh, uh, responsive and timely solutions. We have focused on on these five areas, and some of them are already in progress. Some are still waiting, but we wanted to develop this kind of long term um, perspective. The immediate one you can see in the in the first one: how we strengthen the capacity of early childhood professionals to provide psychological first aid and to deal with stress and burnout because that can be a, a real danger. Secondly, we wanted to empower our organizations 
to build capacity at the municipality level, um, to provide support to municipalities, how they can respond in a short and medium term, how we can create this uh, infrastructure of knowledge for strategic thinking, to build the needs analysis and to act accordingly so that the services are meeting the needs. The third one, which will stay for quite some time, and it's not a new issue, uh, is just that re re regarding, as I said, inclusion and respect for diversity and how equity uh, and diversity and inclusion are key ingredients for quality. This is something that will need ongoing support because there will be perhaps more um, uh, challenges coming our way um, as we learned already from some of the countries of international tensions. Uh, which might grow, how professionals are prepared to um, mitigate that risk, but also to build the culture of belonging and of um, diversity in the, in the classroom communities or in the communities where, where the families are living. Because there could be formal services, but there could be a lot of non-formal services that can build this social texture at the local level. The first one, which we think is very important, especially in times of crisis, and we, we have felt that during the pandemic, and now it, we have the second time confirmation that the learning communities are so important for professionals. You need to have pay, uh, peers with whom you can dialogue, you can uh, mirror your practice, you can um, raise issues that you are uh, grappling with. This is so important because in, in certain, in crisis situations, Professionals might feel uh, insecure. Uh, it's, there are new challenges that they don't have the right answer. And there might not be even the right answer at, at a certain point. How we build, how we can co-construct that answer. That's so important uh, in the countries and across countries. And the fifth one, for, for sure, we will dedicate a lot of our work to support uh, organizations that are working in Ukraine in the reconstruction of the systems uh, there. I'm going to share now um, and would just be very curious then to understand if there are any experience that we can share actually, and you can put in the chat box, if there, are, if there are programs that you have known about in your country and it would be wonderful to learn from them, or um, if, if there are experiences that we could consider in sharing across countries that are coming from your countries, because there is a lot of space for learning at this point. We just mentioned the first strand of uh, pillar action uh, of that we have focused on. And I'm glad to share with you actually the very recent uh, um, feeling and knowledge that I have uh, from the training of trainers that we organized, uh, two of them already, with the countries I've mentioned at the very beginning, um, on a foundational training on psychological first aid and trauma-informed practices uh, with young children and their caregivers. It's so important. And we had professionals coming from all those countries. Um, we provided this training in understanding uh, where, where the professional in early childhood education and care can provide support and where not, what they can do and what they cannot do. Because they might be tempted to do a lot, but they also there might be something that puts a lot of pressure and stress on them. Do no harm means not only to do the right thing, but not to do more than you can do. Uh, and I think that's so important to be explained to uh, professionals because they do feel the burden of and responsibility. Yes. So what are the expectations from them and what kind of um, um, practices that they should enable in classrooms so that they are confident that they are doing the right thing? But there are, there are lots of things that actually they are already doing, but they might not be aware of or there might be a lot of activities that they are proposing, but they need to be very mindful of how those reflect or can be perceived by children that have been uh, going through traumatic experiences. Just uh, listening to one colleague from Ukraine and they were saying, you know, it, it might be fun in other contexts to uh, pinch a, a balloon, but in, in, in this context for some children might be extremely traumatic. So there are little things that uh, you, we need to be very mindful of when providing uh, an, a safe space, but also emotionally safe space so that children can learn. So we're doing, we're doing this training of trainers, but a training we know, um, it's not enough. It will not you know, uh, clear the sky. Uh, that needs to be supported. There's coaching going on uh, that will happen. Uh, uh, so the training we did at the cross country level, 
trainings in the country and then coaching. There are lots of unknown uh, questions, uh, unknown answers to many of the questions that might come from the practice. Um, there will be a lot of learning that can happen within the country and across the countries in terms of what practices work well, which are, uh, because there's a, a, a lot of expertise in, in practice, but which ones have shown to be very inspiring for practitioners or the, there might be lots of ideas that are not necessarily, um, let's say, um, valued or uh, put uh, surfacing, let's say, uh, in uh, in the privacy of the practice of each individual. So need, they need to have the um, place where they can share. Um, having the learning communities in each country, it's something that helps a lot professionals. And during the pandemic, they learned a lot from each other. And that's what we are uh, continuing to do also in this context. But also we know that uh, English, it's not always the language that can um, be the best channel of, of uh, um, disseminating resources. So a lot of translation of resources will also happen because there are many resources that are in English, although a lot has been translated lately, but maybe not uh, in all the languages of the countries uh, where they are um, encountering a lot of challenges in supporting practitioners. And you, you hope you could see the countries that are, have been involved. And just a few words about the psychological first aid, because it might sound very sophisticated. And even though the word psychological sometimes for practitioners sounds um, a bit threatening or they might question themselves, what am I going to do, become a psychologist overnight? And actually it's not. And that's something that we also want uh, very much to be clearly understood. And as I said, set the right expectations. Um, you you might also have been through a psych and not a, a, a psychological first aid, but the medical first aid. We don't become uh, neither nurses, neither um, medical doctors by having attended, but we know what to do if in such a situation we have to support, uh, we have to help an individual. And it's almost the same in this case with the psychological first aid. Uh, it's just a set of skills and competences that can enable people working in the uh, in in context with children, how to reduce the the initial distress of children that can be caused by so many uh, factors, and that's so important to know because you can do harm without being aware that you are doing harm while being so well intentioned, and that's something that we try to translate not only the concept what actually that means in practice, what practitioners can do to uh, reduce the stress or to uh, smoothen the trauma that the children might carry with them. Not all of them might carry a trauma, but they might be distressed for different reasons. I mean, even being separated from a father can be a huge reason for distress uh, and so on. And for this reason, we know that the early childhood education and care uh, staff can play a huge healing role, but they need to be supported. Uh, this has not been part of their training, or there has not been a particular attention given to this topic. Well, what uh, as also, I don't think that um, many of us have, have been, um, since we haven't had for decades uh, a situation of a war, and we, we have not lived the individual personal subjective experience of it. And we need to learn what actually that means, uh, how, what kind of impact would have um, and that's something that uh, we have learned a lot. That there's, besides of the uh, physical deprivation, um, there's a lot of feeling of feeling fearful or unsafe or powerless or ruthless, overly stressed. There is a feeling of loss and dislocation from your own people, from your own home, your neighborhood, the places that were so familiar to you, from your own land. Uh, and there's a, a feeling of constant danger. I'm not talking from personal experience uh, the same, but there's a, a lot that we can learn from countries that have been through that. And there are lots of organizations that do share this a lot now, um, um, and not only now, um, but there's a, a constant danger and insecurity. All these landscape of feelings are encapsulated in each uh, individual that might have fled. We don't know to what extent, which one is the most dominant one, but we need to learn about this. We need to, to be clear that there is something that we can do, but we need to know what actually is needed to, for that. And more importantly, there, there are already um, a lot of, let's say, knowledge resources that are indicating what could be the signs of distress in children so that 
professionals can identify them and they can deal with them or they would know how to react to them or what could be the type of intervention that they could have in different contexts. And you can see just a few examples. I'm not going to read them. Uh, what does that mean for a children are under two years of age and what the, how, how uh, children are from three to six years old uh, might react? There are many signs that could indicate that the child is in distress. And that's so important for professionals to notice, for parents also to notice. And then the communication between professionals and parents is uh, becoming extraordinarily important. For this reason, there is uh, there are a few, and this has been part also of the training that we have done with the, with the trainers that will work at the country level. There are three principles so important in this work uh, of providing psychological first aid. Look, listen, and link. Look, this, is, this means observation. You, you don't make any assumption. You just need first to understand and see what's the behavior, how the children is reacting, if there are signs of distress. And you need to be very careful on or observe in different contexts and situations how the child is behaving and reacting also. But secondly, is that about listening? And that's what perhaps uh, is it's underrated for, let's say, in, in many of the cases, because people are having the urge to do something before listening. Listening is extremely important because um, there are many of them that are not ready to speak and you, know, you need to know when they are ready to speak. So you need to have the patience, uh, but also uh, have active listening. They might want to talk and you, non, you can't, you don't, you have, don't have to re misinterpret what they are uh, telling, not making any assumption. And after listening, which might be very healing for the person that is ready to talk, then there is the link. And that means if I cannot help, I can connect uh, the, the child or, the, per, or the, the adult, be that a mother or an aunt or a father in cases that are um, in other situations than this one, link with a professional, link with a service that can help more than I can do. As I said, early childhood education and care professionals might do as much as the remit of their profession allows them, as their professional uh, competence allows them to. When it goes beyond, they need to connect with another professional. These are basic principles in providing psychological first aid. And sometimes each of them require a specific type of skill. What For what should I look? <laughs> uh, how should I listen? And to whom I should connect with if I cannot help? These are extremely important things that uh, not all professionals are aware of. And perhaps they might do, or they might do them, but they might not be necessarily aware of how they can um, move forward and not feel the stress. They might help a lot. They are, um, um, the, the early childhood education and care service might be safe havens for children. Um, they need to recover their childhood. And for that reason, they could be, you know, the safe, the caring and the supportive relationships that can heal them. But playing is healing. And what professionals know for this age group, he, playing is extremely important, even for uh, children that are living in peacetime. But in this case, it can be extremely healing. And attention to play, how children play and providing all kinds of um, uh, context where they can enjoy playing it's extremely healing for them. Equally important is to strengthen the capacity of early pro uh, childhood professionals to provide, uh, to, be, to prepare themselves for uh, avoiding the burnout. Caring for professionals is becoming so, so important. I was mentioning before, because working with distressed children and adults, it's uh, at times very overwhelming and stressful. There's not enough uh, knowledge uh, about uh, how we can protect ourselves, or it's not bad to protect ourselves. Um, and learning communities can be one of the mechanisms, but this has to happen at the level of the service. Paying attention to this, uh, in general, caring for early childhood education and, uh, and care staff, it's such an important thing in, at, uh, in general, in peacetime also, but in, in this context becomes even a higher priority. I was mentioning that, uh, and I will move now from the, the pillar that I was mentioning about building the capacity in professionals to the one that focuses on, on the, on the uh, municipality level. Um, building capacity, we have worked across countries um, to build that capacity. It's so important for municipalities to be able to 
make a, a fast needs uh, analysis and to have already the capacity, the, the knowledge infrastructure to develop a strategic plan. These are things that are so important in this moment. And we have done that in, and we continue doing it in uh, several countries. And we are um, uh, supporting very much the development of such uh, non-formal services, the ones that are transitioning. As I was mentioning, the playgroups, the family hubs, they might be better for certain categories of children and uh, families, the ones that don't want to be feel separated, mothers that do not have enough time to concentrate or to do the search where my child should be. And they would just want a few hours uh, uh, you know, to have the child in a safe place, uh, but not on the entire day. So these are excellent solutions for, for meeting the specific needs of specific families. This is something that we call transitioning and inclusive services. They might not be necessarily only for refugees. These are actually solutions that can be provided at the local level for all those that do not uh, attend the services. And it could be a way of bringing them closer to the services as transitioning towards more formal services. I will move now to the part on, on uh, developing communities, uh, learning communities in and across countries. As I was mentioning, this is so important. And uh, we, we can't say how much, it's, uh, how much learning exists actually uh, when teams from different countries are meeting together on a regular basis or providing, feeding the, the, the knowledge uh, sharing across countries, how inspirational it is and how solutions are blooming uh, you know, across countries because of having, oh, I heard from there. You might know that already, but there are not many platforms of this kind. And there, this is something that uh, we learned a lot that in, in, for this particular topic of how we can support better children and, and families that fled from Ukraine, it's, it, it's absolutely uh, of a high demand. And that's something that uh, we feed and we nurture at the, at the country level, but also um, at the cross country level. We don't do this alone. We are also, you have seen perhaps on the slides, we've uh, partnered with Warchal Colin, with Amna, um, both of them having been specialized in working with refugees and with the UNICEF, the regional office for uh, Europe and Central Asia. And we're working with partners that can strengthen our work, but we leverage our strengths together. Takeaways. And with this, I'm going to close my presentation, hoping that it was useful. Um, at the national system, at, there are different levels on which we kind of placed our, um, let's say, overall reflections, how far we got and what is actually uh, needed, what are, where, where the priorities are sitting. Um, one is about the, the fact that the current crisis um, has, has just showed that there are a lot of vulnerabilities. And you already mentioned when we said how ready the systems are, we could just see that they're in many places. And actually I said, it's true. And those have surfaced also during the pandemic time, uh, but they are still there. This came really after we did not really uh, manage to um, recover uh, from the period of uh, the COVID pandemic. So this stays on the table. I mean, access for vulnerable groups and now for refugees, it's one of the biggest challenges that the systems already have in place. Although we have to say that the, the, the recent the report that was launched last year about uh, inclusive early childhood education and care uh, services at the European Commission from the uh, working group where I'm also a member, provides a lot of inspirational examples from countries on how you can bid, uh, uh, how you can strengthen the inclusion at different levels in the systems. Um, and many of the things have been done in, in, in many systems before the, the war and before the pandemic also. There are still a, a, a lots of systems that are, are still struggling and grappling with this issue. At the local system, um, I was mentioning there might be national policies that are already in place, but the problem are that the solutions, the services are provided at the local level uh, and they can, they can take different shapes and they can be... Um, yeah, they can adjust themselves to the needs of the population that they are serving. And that's not always happening. There's not enough flexibility there. Um, and that's something that it, it's, it remains a problem. It's like we're providing the same services that we know about and they should be in place while they might not be relevant for all those that are in the communities. And now, particularly for those that are, have fled. 
At the workforce level, I think that's uh, another issue that, well, again, the, the other uh, report that was released last year um, from the working group at the European Commission on Early Childhood Education and Care, it was about the workforce, how to recruit, to retain, and to build the professionalism in, in, in the workforce, in the staff on early childhood education and care. Well, I think that this remains a, a big priority um, in all the countries as they are underpaid, undervalued, uh, and there's a lot that uh, countries should do. Um, but in this case, they really need support. They really need uh, um, professional development opportunities that can uh, answer to their need uh, to learn more of how they can address the issues that are encountering in everyday practice with children that uh, um, have fled Ukraine. And the, the, the last level where we um, saw that there, there is still a lot of work to do and that will take some time, uh, it's a, about the practice level. We need to have uh, services and practices and activities, so from more general to more concrete, um, that are recognizing the harmful impact of traumatic experience on children. I think that there's not enough preparation, but there are also not enough practices that are really responding to that need. Flexible program, I mean, program in the sense from morning, afternoon, that could be at different times, or um, the, how the environment should be organized, or uh, what kind of interactions should uh, have uh, take place, how the child should be approached, the family should be approached, what kind of play opportunities we should provide indoor and outdoor, art is healing. So there are lots of stress releasing uh, activities. Um, language facilitation. Language is a barrier and we addressed it also in the training that we have done because there are ways in which there is there is a period of time that we have to leave uh, to, to let, th let things happen uh, until child starts the acquisition of new words and uh, of the new language, kind of getting closer and closer uh, to learning the language. But also a lot of community cohesion building, uh, community building and cohesion activity inside the group of children. These are all things that should have happened already in many in many services, and it's linked with the, how inclusive they are, but also on how much uh, how much has been invested in preparing professionals to address them. These are just a few of the things that I wanted to share with you from the experience that we have had of working in the past month and uh, enabling uh, lots of um, our contribution, let's say, to, to build the, the readiness of the system to address the, the needs of um, professionals and uh, the needs of children and families. I don't know if there have been um, questions, Marta, or uh, if there are any comments uh, that uh, our colleagues might have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, Michaela, for the for bringing here expertise in, in the field. I think it was really, really useful for for the teachers and the participants because uh, we, we had a lot of, of well, let's say, engagement and interaction in the chat. Um, for the time being, there are no questions, but of course, we invite participants to post the questions. We have still a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, I remind you to save the link that my colleague Eleonora just posted in the chat for the feedback form. You can just save it now and then complete it later. Uh, and remember that no certificates are issued for this webinar. Uh, but we have, uh, while I was talking, uh, a, a question, I think, came in the chat. Um, any plans on expanding foundational training to other countries that have large influence on refugee, influx of refugees? Um, yes, I think that can be possible. It's a question of, uh, I mean, there is an email address that I have put on, um, on the screen. Maybe, I don't know if you can go back. We can go back. To um, yes. So uh, you can just write to, to my email. There are plans, and I think we are learning uh, about the needs as they are emerging. We started with uh, the first cohort <laughs> uh, of trainers, but uh, yeah, we know that there is a high demand. So um, you feel free to contact, and uh, we can uh, explore further. 
Yes, okay, and the presentation will be shared. Yes, there is. There was a question about the presentation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Technical question uh, regarding presentation and recording. Everything will be shared on the webinar page. Give us some time, so probably won't be today. But yeah, you will find everything on the webinar page. Um, I'm going to read uh, what Natalia just posted in the chat. Uh, a child from Ukraine. Sorry, I'm losing it. Uh, a child from Ukraine is included in the. I saw it. Program. Yes. Okay. I so think, you can go. Yeah, I think yeah. yes. I think what I was trying actually to say is that, um, well, I've talked about the services that are for children up to six years old, the entry entry age for school. Um, for those that are attending school, I think for them attending extracurricular activities that are creating the feeling of safe emotionally and physical safety and also on um, starting learning the language so everything that uh, smoothens the transition to feeling safe in the new environment is very much recommended so arts uh, even those kind of activities that are not only mediated by written language or yes yeah, spoken language or other type of language like art or music or play as i said it's very important for their well-being. It's not, we don't need to urge them to speak from today to tomorrow. I don't know how many words it will come, but just they just need time for that. Uh, being exposed, it matters. For the youngest one, it's even easier because the more they are exposed to language, the, the easier they will learn and the, the faster they will learn. But we need to also be mindful that those that have a different age, they need time and they feel already stressed that they are in an environment where they are not understood enough. Uh, or they do not understand the others enough. And we need to create other ways of communicating beyond uh, language um, of the country or Ukrainian language that can um, help them establish communication. They need to be, feel supported. They need to have friends. They, they need to have warmth. They need to feel uh, part of the community. That helps them learn. Uh, what I was talking about the toxic stress is that if we're not um, relax enough. We there is a bit of stress that can help learning, but we are not learning a lot we, when we are under a lot of stress. And that's for children important at any age, not only when they are very young. So yes, in participating in other types of uh, activities, um, it's very important. And providing them in safe space in the communities, it's so so important for them. Yeah, indeed. Um, thank you. And if you have a time, we maybe can address the last question. Uh, that was from Tatiana, who works on um, ISSA materials in Hungary, who can support preschools in receiving children and offering support coaching capacity development. Uh, Yes, we have not yet trained in Hungary. So at the moment we have, we cannot, but we are in discussions with our colleagues there. So um, we work with the organization that is called Partners uh, Hungary. I think Ala Pidvani, if I'm not pronouncing it wrong. So Partners Hungary is the organization, our member organization, and uh, they have a lot of experience in uh, capacity building in running professional development trainings and so. Uh, and for sure, we, uh, they also said we want the training also. Uh, it's very much needed and we are aware that is uh, a lot of need. But feel free to also subscribe to our, uh, our newsletter or to use our um, go on our website. You will find information about the work we are doing. And there might be resources that are already in Hungarian. So we are trying to translate a lot of the resources in at least in the countries that the neighboring countries language. Um, there's also a very good uh, guidebook for those that uh, are working in early childhood uh, um, uh, in, in the early childhood field. Um, it's called Building Bridges that has been informed by the work that we did in Greece. I saw a lot of colleagues from Greece um, that provides a lot of inspiration about the learning environment, the activities that can be provided. So I recommend that you just visit our website and uh, look at the web page uh, support for Ukraine. But there could be already a lot of resources. We put them for services, um, for practitioners, for parents, caregivers, and they might be also in different languages. We are uploading those that we select as being quite relevant. In this way, hoping that we can um, contribute and, and you know 
contribute to the system readiness because that if all of us would contribute to that uh, you know with our in remit the remit on the mandate of our organization would matter a lot yeah thank you very much and as you said um, for the participants you have all the links here and you will have them also in the presentation once we shared it in the page uh, so I think we are moving towards the end. Uh, thank you very much, Michaela, for, for accepting our invitation and, uh, and for joining us today. Uh, there are a lot of many thanks for you in the chat. And as Audra thank was you, saying, also. definitely some, some food for thought and some good ideas you, you brought today. So thank you. Thank you very much once again. And of course, thank you to all the participants who, who joined us uh, today. I wish you all a good evening and a nice summer break. So bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Marta. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Bye.